Hello everyone, hope everyone is doing well. Today we're going to learn about the Federal Reserve and its main policy instrument, which is the monetary policy. Now, Federal Reserve is a central bank. It is the central bank of the United States. Now, a central bank is basically a bank that creates money and controls money supply. Almost every country in the world has a central bank. Some countries who have a common currency may just have one central bank, like the European Central Bank issues euros and controls the supply of euros. So basically, the European Central Bank is the central bank of the European Union. For UK, it is the Bank of England. And then for other countries, we have other central banks. Now, the job of the central bank, as we said, is to create money supply or is to create money and control the money supply. Now, as we will see in this lecture later in the lecture, we will see that Federal Reserve or other central banks can change the money supply when needed in order to spur economic growth or to dampen um, the economy if it's growing too fast. So there are th different instruments that the Federal Reserve or any central bank uses to control money supply. So some of the instruments used by the central banks to control money supply are, so one is the reserve requirement ratio, and then this is usually like basically the Federal Reserve or a central bank telling banks how much they can keep how much they must keep within their bank vaults as cash and how much they can give out as loans. The other one is open market operations, which is the purchase and sale of government bonds or government securities. They also help to control money supply. Then we have discount rate, which is the interest rate that which central banks loan money to other banks and finally we have the federal funds rate which is the rate at which banks lend money to each other now collectively all these things and there are there may be others too these instruments are collectively known as monetary policy the other policy is fiscal policy which is government changing of government taxation and expenditure to control the economy Monetary policy is sometimes favored more than fiscal policy because it is relatively fast. So it acts relatively quickly to change the state of the economy. Fiscal policy may take a lot of time to go through the legislative uh, body and then get passed. And then finally, the money goes to the required um, government agencies and then finally and all those other steps have to be followed before they can actually t have a, the required effect. Monetary policy is just controlled by the central bank so it's much quicker to do. They can use one of these um, instruments in order to change the money supply which can then affect the economy. So let's look at each of the instruments of um, the monetary policy and we will start with the reserve requirement ratio and for that we have to look at commercial banks because they are mainly implemented on commercial banks so again let's talk about what is a bank a bank is a place that gives out loans and accepts our savings so basically they give out loans to businesses or to individuals if i want to expand my business or create a new business i go to a bank i give my um, business plan to them and the bank then decides whether they want to give us a loan or not. The bank can also accept our savings in their deposits for protection and safeguarding and so we normally put our savings or part of our savings in our banks. So a bank, the word bank comes from the word banco which means bench. Um, initially back in history um, whenever there were money lenders they would work in marketplaces by sitting on benches or having a table in front of them and from that word um it's um from that word banco we now have the word bank so how does banks affect money supply 
Now banks, one thing that banks do is banks accept, as I said, accept our savings and then use it to provide loans. So let's look at a simple way of how banks do that. So we are going to draw a, what we will call a T account of a bank. So let's say this is a, just a generic bank we have. And a T account basically lists our assets and our liabilities that we have in a bank. So we will see how a bank operates in order to understand what, how reserve requirement ratio affects the banks and affects money supply. So imagine we have, I will write in this corner, let's say, imagine we have 1,000, we have 1,000 depositors, or basically 1,000 people in this community, and they each want to deposit let's say $100 each in the bank. So in total, then we will have 1,000 times 100, which equals to $100,000 deposited. So when a depositor puts money in a bank, so let's say depositors are us, we consider our deposits, which is each $100,000 or each $100 that we have, this is going to be our asset. So this is the depositor's assets. So depositors consider this amount to be their own money that they have put in a bank. Now we are putting the bank and we're putting that money in a bank so that bank safeguards our money so that the bank does not lose our money. So to a bank, this deposit or all these deposits are when they accept that deposit in their vault, then this is a liability to a bank. Because to them, this is the amount that they have to safeguard. And if I ever want to withdraw my money, they have to provide that money to us. So we are going to then, let's say all 1,000 individuals decide to put the money in the bank. So we will have our deposit in the bank, which is going to be $100,000. So the bank accepted everyone's deposits. We all opened uh, our accounts. So there are 1,000 depositors. There are 1,000 accounts. Each of us deposited $100. So the bank in total has $100,000 as deposit. Now let's say that the bank also has, the owners of the bank has invested money in the bank. So they also have put in some of their money in the bank and they have kept that money there just so that, you know, this is their initial capital that they put in. So, so we will call this owner's equity. Let's say that amount is 10,000. So in total, we see that the bank's total liabilities, because, and then again, we're uh, another question here that might be why is owner's equity in liability? Why isn't it in assets? Well, owner's equity is, again, when we think about it, if this is the bank and this is the, basically depositors, us and owner, the bank and the owner and the depositors are all separate entities. So the bank is considered to be a separate person when it comes to accounting and stuff. So when the owner is putting in $10,000 into the bank and the depositors collectively are putting in $100,000 to the bank, so for the owner and the depositors, these are assets. But to the bank, this total amount is considered to be a liability, and so is it for the owner. So that's why we put the owner's equity in the liability section. In some books, it's also called bank capital, so we can just write this bank capital. Now, the bank can put all these money in their vault and it won't grow or do anything, but the bank needs money to run its operations, to pay the salaries of people who are working there, to pay for, let's say, building upkeep or building rent. So the bank needs to do something with the money in order to earn more money. So the primary way that a bank earns money is by giving out loans. 
So a loan is mainly given to businesses or individuals or individuals. Let's say somebody comes into the bank and asks for a $10,000 loan. The bank reviews the proposal and they're like, if they find that this person is worthy of getting a loan, they'll say that, okay, well, you can get this loan, but you also have to, when you return this loan, you have to pay back this $10,000 plus, let's say, 7% interest. Let's say the loan is for one year. So in one year's time, they should pay 7% extra. So 7% extra means 7% of 10,000 would be equal to $700. So this $700 is considered to be uh, the income for the bank, which they use to pay their um, employees or pay up and earn some profit, so which they then pay back to their owners. So as you can see that if I have $100, $110,000, then my best way to earn the most money would be if I give out all those $110,000 as loans. So if I give out all those $110,000 as loans, then, you know, I should get the most money. The more money I have sitting in my vault, idly in my vault, the less I'm able to earn. So, but this creates a problem because now, if one of the depositors, you know, we have the money is from the depositors. If one of the depositors is like, give me $50, I want to go to the bank and say, like, all right, I want to withdraw $50. If all the money is tied up in loans, then the bank cannot pay out this money. And that creates problems because then people are going to the bank and they're like, where is my money? I thought you were supposed to safe keep my money. But if all the money is tied up in loans, that would be a problem. So what the bank then does is it keeps some money set aside as cash so that the rest can be given out as loans. So usually let's say the bank let's say the bank keeps 10% of deposits are kept as cash or we can call it reserves. Out of all the deposits we get, which is 100,000, 10% of it remains as cash. The rest 90,000 or 90% can be given out as loans. So then we call that amount reserves. So 10% of 100,000 would be $10,000. Okay, and the rest can be given out as loans. So the rest remaining is 100,000. So my total on my left hand side is also 110,000. Note that the reserves is only on basically the deposit, not on the bank capital that we have. Now, is this reserve enough? Well, let's say we have $10,000 of reserve. Let's say five people come in and they each want, you know, five of the depositors come in and they each want to take away $90. So we have $450 that we need to pay out. There is $10,000 of reserve, so this amount can easily be met. Now, who decides that the reserve that I said that we we use the example here that the reserve requirement is 10%. So that means that whatever deposit I get, 10% of it must be kept in the bank as reserves. The rest can be given out as loans. This requirement is determined by the central bank. So in our case, by the Federal Reserve or the Fed. So the Fed tells to banks that you must keep, let's say, 10% of your reserves or 10% of your deposits in the vault as reserves. And the banks must follow that. If the banks don't, then they may be fined or they may even be closed. So this is to safeguard that whenever I want to go and withdraw my deposits, I will be able to get that amount. So 
this is the requirement by central bank and this is one way as we said that central bank controls the money supply now how is that to see that let's say that just to keep it simple let's say one person goes to this to this bank and asks for a ten thousand dollar loan so the bank then looks through all their paperwork and sees that okay this is fine everything checks out and so the bank gives that money out to the person as a loan so from here as we see that the loan is the bank has given out a hundred thousand dollars as loan so we're just considering actually let's see that let's look at an example so let us copy this down here and we have this amount so initially when we get all the deposits in there is basically all the money is within the reserves nothing has been given out as loans so loans are still zero so if the reserve requirement is is 10 percent or ten thousand dollars here then we say that the bank has excess reserves of one hundred and ten thousand minus ten thousand which equals a hundred thousand dollars so there is excess reserves in the bank now this excess reserves is not doing any good so um, they need to be given out as loans so let's say somebody comes to the bank and asks for a ten thousand dollar loan the bank provides that loan after analyzing it the bank's like okay this is fine so your loan is granted and provides ten thousand dollars as loans and then it's to be paid in a few years time at a certain interest rate so let's say now the loan is ten thousand dollars given out i now have reserves sitting in my bank at a hundred thousand so in this case and then slowly uh, the bank can keep on drawing out of reserves to loans until the reserves are at ten thousand dollars because the reserve requirement is ten thousand dollars the reserve can never be lower than ten thousand dollars if the depositor if the deposit is a hundred thousand dollars but it can keep more money than that now let's say after the bank has given taken after the person has taken out this amount of loan they don't want to keep that as cash so they the person keeps the loan in another account so they take the loan ten thousand dollars of loan and they put it in another they deposit it in their bank account now just to keep it simple let's say that the account we're just looking at that ten thousand dollars so in that case let's just look at deposit and reserves and loan okay. so they deposited ten thousand dollars so initially the reserves go up by ten thousand dollars but if the reserve ratio for this thing is so let's assume reserve ratio equals 10 percent so initially the reserves go up to ten thousand dollars but the bank only has to keep ten percent of it and they can give out the rest as loan so let's say eventually in a couple of days when someone else comes and gets the loan a loan has been given out of nine thousand dollars so ten percent has been kept as reserves nine thousand has been given out as loans now here's the thing these depositors have their money so they already have let's say the depositors from whom i got the ten thousand dollars from they don't know that i took the loan they don't know me the bank knows me but the individuals who whose money i'm using in my loan do not really know me so they think 
they have ten thousand dollars now i let's say i took that ten uh ten thousand dollar loan i think i have ten thousand dollars in my account okay? now someone else got this loan they also now think that they have nine thousand dollars of money so that original ten thousand dollars of deposit that i took out as loan i feel like i have this money this other person thinks they have that money so in total we think that we both have nineteen thousand dollars between us however it's that money is technically there's not enough cash to pay all that we have those money in our account we have them as our like deposits but it's this original person's money that has multiplied throughout and it doesn't stop here let's say that this nine thousand dollars is now deposited in another account so we have nine thousand dollars deposited in another account the bank only has to keep 10% of that. So $900 is kept as loan as their loan and 8100 is now given out or $900 is kept as reserves and 8100 is now given out as loans. Now someone else believes they also have $8100 of money. So now between all three of us, we now have 10,000 plus 9,000 plus 8,100, which equals 0, 0, 001, 27,100. So that original $10,000 that I have taken out of cash that was deposited has now multiplied and became 27,100. And this keeps on going. If I deposit this in another account, then it will grow again so and this keeps on going until all the money has been loaned out in that for that ten thousand dollars so this is what we call the money has been multiplied so what happened is the ten thousand dollars that i initially took out as loans that ten thousand dollars of deposit will be multiplied if given out as loans and banks, whenever they make a loan, they create new money. Now, how much can be uh, in created? So if I added all of them, I would basically get 10,000 plus plus 9,000 plus 8,100 plus and so forth. And it will keep on happening until this amount actually became 100,000. So that $10,000 of deposit will eventually multiply and become $100,000 of money. Or in other words, the $10,000 of cash put in the bank will increase money supply to $100,000. And this is called that the money has been multiplied. Now, how do we know it has increased to 100,000 and not 200,000 or 500,000? We know that the money multiplier is equals one over R, where R is the reserve requirement. So in our case, R is 10%. So money multiplier equals one over 10%, which equals 10. So ten thousand dollars of deposits will eventually become ten thousand times ten which equals to one hundred thousand dollars of money circulating in the economy so in that case money uh, the reserve requirement becomes very important if I let's say I reduce the reserve reserve requirement to 5%.
then money multiplier would be 1 over 5%, which equals to 20. That means that if I give out $10,000 of loans, it will make money supply, or if I, if I let's say initially have 10,000 of deposit and given out as loans, it will make money supply increase to 10,000 times 20, which equals to $200,000. So the lower the reserve requirement, the higher the eventual money supply. The higher the reserve requirement, the lower will be the money supply. So then reserve requirement becomes very important. And so the central bank, or the Fed in our case, controls the reserve requirement to control the money supply. If the reserve requirement or if the money supply is too low, the Fed can lower the reserve requirement, which increases money supply. So that is one way the Fed can control money supply. And why is that important? Let's say that the economy is not doing so well and um, not enough businesses are investing uh, or creating new capital. If the economy is not doing well, then the Fed could lower the reserve requirement creating more money or more funds to be given out as loans. So as more loans are available, more money is available. Imagine like, you know, if banks have a lot of money that they need to give out, a lot more money. So the price of loan, which is interest rate, can decrease and so more can be given out as loans. This can spur economic growth. So this is one way that Fed can control the economy, but reserve requirement, changing the reserve requirement is considered to be very drastic. So it is not used or it is not, let's say it is actually in effect, but reserve requirements are not changed frequently. So they are kept at 10% or 5% and kept at that level. And basically the banks have to follow that. So the next way that the Fed controls money supply, and this is far more popular, is open market operations, which is the buying and selling of government bonds. So the banks have to hold some money some of their cash in government bonds. So let's look at this example that we have. So we have our bank here, our uh, commercial bank, our regular bank here. So what they do is we need to insert another call our row here, and we can call this um, government bonds. So besides having money in the reserve. So let's say that assume R equals 10%. So then supposing everything has been given out. So reserves is 10%, loan is let's say 80,000. And so government bonds is 20,000. So the federal, um, the federal reserve can make, or the government whenever um, they want to get money from for their different um, activities, or uh, let's say. So what happened here? So we know that we have our ten thousand dollars of deposit. Ten percent of it has been kept as reserves. Now, out of the rest that we have, some have been given out as loans, and some have been kept as government bonds. So government bonds are basically government. IOUs. Government needs money to run their businesses and their different entities. So government normally gets money through taxes. But taxes are usually less than expenditures. Government expenditures is much higher. So to meet this gap, the government issues bonds, 
which is basically, let's say this was, if we are the individuals in the banks and us individuals, we can also buy bonds. So we buy bonds from the government using cash. And so the government gets this cash and we get the bond, which we cannot use to do other stuff. Now using that cash, government can now carry out their expenditure. In the future, government will redeem the bond, will buy the bond back from us and pay us some int interest as a reward for giving or loaning, loaning some money out to the government. So we have this going on here. Let's say the government, the bank has bought $20,000 of government bonds. Now we may think that, okay, well, the government, or let's say their bank is giving out too much loans or in total there is is too much loans being given out and if more loans are being given out there's more economic activity higher demand that can lead to higher inflation and it can lead to us basically maybe like um an overheating of the economy because more is being produced and then let's say if something happens and a few people start defaulting on the loans, then there is a possibility of the whole system crashing. So the central bank or Federal Reserve is just like, you know, Goldilocks and Three Bears. They don't want the economy to be, to be too hot. They don't want it to be too cold. They want it to be just right within a certain bandwidth. So if too many loans are being given out, they have to reduce the number of loans. So how do we reduce the number of loans? Well, we may have to basically reduce the supply of available funds given out as loans. So if we reduce, so the depositors are depositing money in the bank. So here, let's say we have 100,000 deposited, 10% is as reserve. So technically 90,000 of those deposits can be given out as loans. Now the government thinks this is number is too high, although the 10,000 has been bought as loans, so we need to reduce this number even further. Let's say we want to reduce this number to 50,000. So what the government then does is, government then, or in our case, since the government continuously issues um, government bonds to raise capital to fund all their expenditures. So the Fed then makes the banks buy government bonds. So let's say that we needed the loans, as we said, were 80,000 and they need to fall to 50,000. So if this is the bank, let's say this is the bank and this is the Fed. So the Fed tells the bank, you got to pay me 30,000 in cash and I'll give you 30,000 in bonds. Okay. So then the basically the loans that redeemed quickly, they were let's say paid back and they went to reserves. Those reserves now are they were excess reserves. Those were now used to buy government bonds. So that 30,000 cash, the Fed gets it, and then the Fed just keeps that $30,000 in cash or burns it. Because the Fed is the uh, organization that produces or creates dollars, they print dollars. So to them, they just keep this and they can destroy it or shred it, and then if needed, they'll create more. Now, this 30,000 that we have in bonds, this cannot be given out as loans. So this is now fixed. So since they cannot be given out as loans, so now money supply will fall. So if the Fed now give, makes banks buy government bonds, fewer funds are available for loans. So the banks have to be more cautious or more vigilant in giving out loans since their ability to like their earnings pool has fallen so now they only can give out loans to those people who are either very credit worthy or to those businesses that are very credit worthy and they have to charge a higher interest rate because the pool is less so 
they can now pick the most profitable projects and they can say, okay, since you're the most profitable projects, we have fewer money, we're giving you this money, so you got to pay us higher interest rates. So then interest rates go up. So here we can see that the Fed, Fed is making the banks buy bonds. So or in other words, we can say the Fed is selling government bonds. So here, Fed is selling government bonds to the banks. So it is called an open market sale, which means that if the economy overheats, the Fed conducts open market sale, which reduces the supply of loanable funds. Consequently, banks can charge a higher interest rate on loans. And so interest rates can go up. This reduces investment and also consumption. If I'm like buying houses by taking up loans or buying a car, taking up loans, consumption, which then cools the economy. Now, conversely, if there's too much loans or if the economy is not doing so well, let's say the economy is basically suffering, there is um, the economy slowing down, then in this case, let's say if the economy is slowing down, the Fed thinks that we need to give out more money as loans. Or instead of we, it should be banks. So when they give out more money, they need to give out more money as loans. So how can they do that? Well, if their money is tied up here in government bonds, the feds can be like, okay, you can, instead of keeping them tied in in government bonds, the fed is going to say, and this is bank, fed will be that I will buy the bonds using cash and in return the fed takes up the government bonds now where does the fed get all this money well the fed will just print the money because the fed controls the supply of money they can print money as well at will so if you're getting the bonds from the bank let's say the fed buys forty thousand of government bonds from the banks so this is called a open market purchase because the Fed is purchasing the government bonds. So in that case, we see that government bonds will fall to 10,000. So 40,000 of government go bonds goes to the Fed. Banks get 30,000 of cash, which it first goes to your reserves because they are part of excess reserves. So 40,000 creates excess reserves of 40,000, which can be given out as loans. So then eventually, I just need to keep 10% of my deposits. So this number can go down to 10,000 and I give out $90,000 of just loans. When supply of loanable funds go up, there's enough being given out. Banks have to can give out more as loans. So they can give out more, they can charge a lower interest rate. So interest rates can go down, which then increases investment and consumption. And as a result, the economy can start growing. So by increasing and changing the supply of government bonds in the bank's vaults, the, um, the uh, Federal Reserve can change the amount of loanable funds, the supply of loanable funds, which then can increase or decrease economic activity. Now, finally, the other way that um, the F uh, Federal Reserve can change uh, mo uh, money supply is the discount rate. Another way that Fed can control money supply is by changing the discount rate. This is the rate Fed charges loans. Sometimes banks may need loans, and if they can't get it from others, they will ask the Fed to give them loans. And so if Fed has unlimited supply of money because they print the money. So if the bank needs the money, they can get the money from Fed. So the discount rate is the rate that Fed charges on loans. So if 
they increase or let's say they then basically um, loans can increase because banks may think it may be cheaper to get the loan from the Fed and as they get more loans from them, they can give it out more as loan. Uh, they can give out more loans to other people and so the supply of loanable go up. Similar to the discount rate, there's another rate called the federal funds rate. This is the interest rate banks charge each other. So sometimes banks may need money from each other. So let's say we have bank A and bank B. Bank A may need a lot of money right now. Maybe um, a big uh, depositor is asking for money and they don't have enough cash in their vaults. So let's say they need a million dollars now. So they don't have enough um, reserves. They may need to like call their some of their loans and ask for the loans to be returned, but maybe they cannot do that because the loans are tied up for something. So then bank A will call bank B and ask for a $5 million loan. Bank B may be like, okay, I can give you the loan. So then bank B loans $5 million to bank A. Now the bank will then charge an interest rate. Bank B will charge an interest rate. Bank A will pay back, will pay back $5 million with some interest to bank B at a later date. Once bank A gets all some of the money back from their loans, so they may be able to pay it back to bank B. Now this interest that we just wrote here, this is called the federal funds rate. This is actually set by the Federal Reserve. So this is also set by the Fed. So the Fed also sets this res uh, interest rate. And this interest rate is very important because by changing this interest rate, the Fed can actually control all the other interest rate. This federal funds rate is considered to be the benchmark interest rate for every other interest rate that we see in the economy. So from, from interest on home loans to credit card interest rate to student loan interest rate. So this is another way they affect the economy. So if if interest rates are too low, Fed raises the federal funds rate, which then increases almost all the interest rates on a one to one ratio. So if federal funds rate goes up by 0.5 percentage points, basically all interest rates will go up by almost around 0.5 percentage points. So in this case, if I see that investment is becoming too high, there's too much economic activity going on, then federal funds, the federal funds rate may be increased to reduce uh, investment by, as interest rates are higher. So hopefully this helps you to understand how the Fed in, uses different instruments in, are in monetary policy to control the money supply. Hope you have a good day and I will see you at a later date. Goodbye.